what would it be like to imagine this dominatrix type person with three lovers and she tells them she no longer wants to be their dominatrix and what would the reaction be madonna pretty much took it from there they kind of wrestled with each other in a sort of improvised choreographed scene kind of in slow motion of them all sort of tangling with each other it's fairly erotic There were moments when things would happen in front of a camera that were just remarkable. There he is, you guys, over there. The highlight of making the movie was running a limousine, riding around Times Square with these crazy people, having a lot of fun. She and Angie were really good friends. The skylight was open in the limousine, so the sun was coming down on them. All of a sudden, they just break into this rendition of Let the Sun Shine. It's quite fetching, actually, but of course, it had no place in the movie. She had to pay her rent one month, and she said she wanted to get paid. There must have been 200 people that were involved in this movie, and the only person that was paid was Madonna. I said, all right, Madonna, if I pay you $100, you need to sign a release. At that time, I hadn't had people sign releases. Again, you have to understand that the level of professionalism here. So she signed the release. I finished the movie in 1984. Coincidental with that finishing, Madonna was starting to become famous. I called Madonna up and I said, well, Madonna, I finally finished the film. She came over to my apartment. And I enjoyed watching the movie. She was positive. She liked it. But then she said, uh, F you when she left. And I said, well, F you too. In 1985, Madonna sued me to stop the movie. And I had her sign release, which was a critical piece of paper. And the best $100 that I ever paid. Coming up. I'm doing what I want to do, all right? And I know you're going to like it. Rare footage of Madonna paying her dues in Clubland. I don't think anyone made Madonna. I think Madonna made Madonna. Just listening to her, I had no doubt in my mind that she would be able to attain everything she aspired for. There was no pretense in what she was doing. It wasn't, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be that. It's more like, I am this. I called Madonna to say, hey, I'm coming to New York. She had this band. She said, well, I need a drummer. I've got a set full of tunes, and I actually have gigs. Now, I don't think she really did have the gigs at the time. We hooked up on the corner of 38th Street and 8th Avenue. There's this building converted to rehearsal studios. Madonna had secured a lock, and we went up, and she played me the songs that they had, and we just kind of jammed the first day. I was excited to find that she had written some solid songs. Like, what are we going to call ourselves? Let's just call ourselves Madonna. It's a catchy name. It's kind of rock and roll. But uh, Steve hated that. No, I'm not going to play in a group called Madonna. And she'd say, well, if we can't call it Madonna, my nickname used to be Emmy, so we'll call it Emmy. Her performance was probably you'd grade it a 10 for energy and enthusiasm. She belted. Hey! She screamed. Shut the f up! The differences between the stage persona and who she was off stage, at least around me, was just there was more vulnerability. There was also the softer kind of, you know, I don't, I'm not quite sure what to do about this. I never hear her be that way in public. Do you actually believe I could ever want to let you go? The magnetism theory of rock and roll was that, you know, get really good and find a record label and our person that would say, oh, you guys are the cat's meow, and we kind of sucked. I mean, we didn't suck bad, but we weren't that good. After a crashing, thunderous ending, there'd be... You know, you kind of hear that. Three or four people's hands clapping. I met Madonna in 1979. I had been working on a film at the time. 
in Artificial Light, which was about a group of disparate characters. Everybody in the film was essentially themselves. All the people wrote their own parts, and hers was a story about herself, using snippets of her poetry, almost fantasies of her transforming from walking down the street to this highly coiffed rock star. I mean, you get out of bed, and you scratch your head, and you stroke the cat, but she's got a rat. So you take a bath, and go down the drain, but you're not afraid because you're not insane. She was enjoyable to watch because you knew you were getting the real person and you weren't getting a veneer she put on. She had a fairly sober childhood, and at this point she's willing to do what she had to do. She came up with the line, I'll do anything for money. I'll do anything for money, because money is my love. Which was sort of the drift of the whole film, in the sense of having to get things done to get to another place. Don't look back. Don't think about what you're doing. Just mix it up. Mean and desperate hours. We basically were eating yogurt and should we put the peanuts in the yogurt or have them as an appetizer? But at some point, Camille Marbone came into the picture. Camille had an office and studios in the same music building. Her partner, Adam, ran into Madonna in the elevator. I was downstairs waiting for one of our clients to arrive, and then Madonna was just kind of skipping through the lobby and inadvertently gave me some flirtatious little remark how I resembled John Lennon. I certainly immediately thought, what does she want from me? You know? Madonna had asked me if I knew anybody that could help her or further her in her career. She had an energy about her. I don't think she was going anywhere with Emmy. So I said, possibly. I got her studio number and I spoke to my partner. Camille also liked what she saw. Camille and Adam were partners in this production company. Their focus was developing new acts. Camille sort of was her knight in shiny armor because she basically took her in, provided food and a place to live. The necessities were getting handled. Madonna was not much different than your average spoiled brat. She got a weekly allowance. If she needed equipment, Gotham would purchase that for her. We gave her studio time, however much she wanted. She would stomp her heels and uh, I want, I want, I want. And we really, you know, we, we wanted to give her those things. We really did. It was like watching a kid play when she went into the studio. She was always just beaming. Camille seemed to be the Svengali of the situation, where she was like the teacher. Okay, this is how you're going to be. You're a rock star now. You're not like in the band anymore. You're the star, they're the band. Camille had sort of convinced Madonna that she would represent her, but she didn't want to keep her band. She just wanted Madonna. So that was the end of that. Camille was pointing the car more towards a Pat Benatar kind of a place. Leotards and headbands and leg warmers. So that was going on downstairs while upstairs I'm working on the kind of more dancier stuff. We knew we needed more than just Madonna. We need to hire about three or four people for more professional sound. And we held rehearsals and auditions. Madonna's choices weren't always Camille's choices for the band members, but we did relinquish one member for her, which was Stephen Bray, the drummer. I was brought into the Gotham situation with it was like probation, because I was a known dangerous element. They had a, a personal connection, an emotional connection. We polished about four tunes, and we immediately uh, had some interest in Madonna. There was a great potential for success there, but as a unit, mm, there was definitely not any kind of momentum. We should sit around and pout and sulk. But Madonna had a real, you know, strong will about her. It was always, okay, well, that didn't work, so what are we gonna do now? Something's not right yet, so let's figure out what it is and let's make it better. Madonna was working with Camille downstairs on rock and roll. And I'm working on dance-oriented tracks upstairs. I started to ask Madonna, hey, will you come sing on this? I know we're doing this other thing with Camille, but that tape that we made had everybody on it. She take the cassettes over to Danceteria. The first time I met Madonna was at a nightclub, and I remember seeing this woman out of the corner of my eye, and she was wearing a white dinner tailcoat, a white old crumpled shirt, some sort of white cropped pants. 
I think probably the third sentence she said was that I want to be the most famous woman in the world. And I just thought, who is this chick? We talked about music and going out dancing. We would meet and, you know, put our makeup on and spike up our hair or shave it off. We were out every single night of every single day of the week of the month. We'd have our pockets full of whatever. I would have lip gloss and she would have her demo tape. She's a smart girl. There was some kind of collision that was going to be inevitable. Camille shopping the rock persona tapes and then dance music being shopped personally by Madonna. She had a road map in her head of where she wanted to bring her talent. It eventually became clear to her that you know, I don't think I am going to be Pat Benatar. As Madonna's vision for herself grew, it became more clear that she would need people that could support her in her own goals, as opposed to people that were going to impose their goals on her. Madonna, I would say, had a selective kind of loyalty towards people. Got the management dissolved, and we went our separate ways. I never got a thank you from Madonna. Nor did I expect it. Coming up, the place where it all came together. Around 81, we opened a club called Danceteria, which became almost like an Andy Warhol kind of scene where everybody who worked at the club were promising artists. Madonna would hang out be one of the regulars there. When Madonna danced, there was always a group of people that would surround her and, and watch her, her moves. And Madonna had come to the DJ booth with the cassette, and I gave it a listen, and thought it was great. I remember being on the second floor and hearing her demo tape and dancing to it and feeling really high and happy. I liked it, and the floor liked it. People didn't say, what the hell is this? This tapes were going over real well at the club. I was doing A&R and Island Records, and I played the song for Chris Blackwell, who passed on Madonna. Also at the time, I had just finished working with David Byrne, the talking head, so I had a relationship with the people up at Sire. I gave him $18,000. I said, you know, try to bring me four or five or six demos, and the third or fourth thing that he brought me was Madonna. I was in the hospital, and I was so blown away by the one song, everybody, that I asked him to bring Madonna to the hospital. She got a singles deal. I was really very excited, because I figured, OK, there's got to be more than $6 in this for me. But there wasn't, because they, <laughs> they wanted Mark to produce and not me. My producing career exploded. I wasn't left in the dust like a lot of other people. It's great to, to produce a record and Watch it climb the charts. Yeah. Come on. They approached me saying, you know, Madonna is doing a showcase. Can you, like, videotape it? we got got $1,000 to spend on it. I remember discussing with her, well, what do you want to do on stage? And then the light bulb, why don't you have some dancers? I remember her saying to me, yeah, I should audition some dancers. And then I said to her, I'll dance for you. And then she said, uh, you can audition for me. I thought, uh-huh, all righty then. <laughs> Up until then, Madonna was never shown. Photographs are not released. People thought she was a black singer. I didn't know who Madonna was, other than she was this girl who was singing in some clubs downtown and had a little heat going for her. Hi, Madonna. I'm from Detroit and I'm 21. I, um, I sing my rec, well, I have 24 track songs that I sing live to, so the music sounds a lot like the record. This song that, that's like out on the radio right now, it's called Everybody, and it's about getting people to dance and lose their inhibitions. So, it's, so I'm, I like taunt my dancers and get them to get up and do different things on their own. The look was very unique, so we were quite excited, and uh, then she read. Look, Dan, you play games and I play games. We're both just too good at it. You didn't expect anything real to happen between us, did you? The role that Madonna came in for was to be a love interest girlfriend for the character of Danny. And she was supposed to be a nice, plain, simple, virginal girl next door. So where were you last night? You're supposed to meet me at 7 o'clock. I waited 45 minutes in the library. You did? Man, see what I mean? You asked me out to see how long I'd wait for you and you wouldn't show up. The reading was very stiff. 
and it just sounded phony. Look, Dan, let's just make like two ships that pass in the night, okay? <laughs> I don't think we have any regrets that we didn't choose her for this role. I think the regret comes that we didn't have the foresight to change the role and then hire her. But hey, next. <laughs> she just really knew that if she wants to get known, we have to get out there and perform. We'd go on these long road trips and um, do these track dates or television shows. See. We were used to dancing in New York. Once you leave the vortex of New York City, the world kind of is a different place. Here's Madonna and everybody. Madonna needs an audience, and that was evident. Gonna have to change your mind. Gonna leave your kids behind. Your body gets an ocean when your feet get in motion. Madonna was trying to do fashion and we were trying to sing and trying to dance and trying to do art. She really wanted to be a solo artist. She really wanted her audience to see who she was. I'm doing what I want to do, all right? And I know you're going to like it. All right, we're going to take a holiday. There weren't any female artists happening at the time, so she really kind of had the whole stage to herself. I knew after Holiday that Donna was ready to rule the planet. She wouldn't have become a star if she didn't always want to become a star. If she hadn't been a beautiful woman, this probably wouldn't have happened. The person that I knew in 1977 now has control of the planet. Maybe she'll write a book and tell us the secret to her success. <laughs> and then do a movie. All this wonderful talent, all she was really searching for the whole time was recognition and love, just like we all are. Probably that's the real reward for this whole journey for her. When I was very Log on to VH1.com for everything Madonna. Check out rare photos and documents in the Madonna scrapbook and see her performance in the rarely seen egg film.